share my screen. Okay, got it. No. I need my camera. So I've mentioned before, like I'm not trying to rush anything. I know I already talk fast, you know that, but um, as far as like when we cover material, I'm just trying to go for it little by little. What is going on with this thing? How did this happen? Let me close that. What that was. There we go. Okay. So back to our calendar, we are going to have to shift it a little bit. And this one always says something like um, I know in the syllabus, I copied and pasted this from the syllabus. It says something like the calendar is subject to change, right? because I don't know how the classes are gonna go. Some sections we may be able to cover faster, some we may have to go slower. And so it may throw us a little bit off. Now, and I really think according to these scores, doing that review on a whole day and then giving you that day to absorb the information and having the test the next day, instead of doing them both on the same day really did help because these scores were a whole lot higher than they were in the previous one. That could have also been because this was only two sections and not three or four as well, right? There's so many factors, but I really think I wanna stay consistent with that notion of having one day for review and then the next day being the test instead of trying to just do Q and A for 45 minutes and then the test, okay? I really think it will help everyone, okay? So because of that, I am gonna to have to go back in and redo this calendar because we're already off, right? Supposedly yesterday we were supposed to cover 1.6, but that's not what we did. We did the test instead, right? So I'm gonna map out a little bit of where it should go. So 9.16, I wanna do 1.6 today. Hopefully we can finish it off. And then on the 20th, we'll do 1.4. On the 21st, we'll do 1.7. And then the 22nd, we'll do 1.8. That will give you actually a whole weekend. So that'll be nice. Um, instead of having that makeup day, that will really help us so that we could do the review and then have the test the following day. So we'll be all right. But I will change that in the calendar when I post up the unit C review, unit C module. So I'm guessing the test will be on whatever date it is. Do you know what that is? Thursday, the 24th, it's Friday, 25, 26, so it's the 27th. Okay, so that's kind of like an overview of what it's gonna look like. Now, some of these sections may be super short, so we may be able to push stuff up, but like I said, I'm not trying to rush through it. If it takes me the whole class period to cover a section, then so be it, okay? Um, if I cover a section in like 30, 45 minutes, then I'll probably start the next one, okay? Because we still have the whole other half of that class period. Now that's different than if I finish a whole section and we only have like 10 or 15 minutes, right? That I can't cover a whole section in 10 or 15 minutes. So we'll go ahead and start with 1.6. Now on the... Unit B review, there was some problem that said something about the uh, quadratic formula. And then there was another section later, or on the test itself, you had that bad problem, right? Um, if you took the in-class um, exam, I think the online class didn't have a problem. I was able to go in there and edit their, their problem on the test so that they took all the tests like they were normally supposed to take it and nothing asked them for quadratic formula. But for this face-to-face -face class, whether you were in person or whether you were online, you had a problem that asked you about quadratic formula and that shouldn't have been on the test, okay? And so I've already done what I needed to do to rectify that, um, but we will eventually get to cover the quadratic formula. So that could be on this next test, but it shouldn't have been on that unit B test, okay? 1.6, though, is about all kinds of equations. 
We know how to solve linear equations. That's when you add or subtract something, right? And then at the end, you divide. Those are not too, too bad. It's just two steps at the most, right? Well, it could get more complicated. I put fractions or crazy stuff in there, right? <laughs> but those are not too bad. The other kinds of equations you guys solved were the quadratic equations where you factored everybody and then you set each little factor equal to zero and you found your solutions that way, right? Um, you also had the extracting roots process for um, quadratics. And then you also have um, the completing the square and then extracting the roots. There's another method for quadratics, which is that, um, what was it called? The quadratic formula, but we're not gonna get to that until the next class, okay? Whenever we do 1.4 and 1.5, that's when we'll get to that one. But for this section, we're gonna continue solving equations, but this section, we're actually gonna get to radical equations, rational exponents. That means you have a fraction up here in your exponent, okay? So we're gonna solve radical problems. These are radicals, just in disguise. And then we're also gonna solve absolute value equations, okay? So three, these two are kind of like the same type of question, um, but essentially two totally different types of equations, okay? So the first thing we need to go to is the polynomial stuff. This stuff you might've already seen before in a previous um, section, but it's the same thing. So they're letting you know that right now you've only learned the four basic methods, which are factoring, extracting roots, completing the square, and then extracting roots. And then this one we have not done just yet. Okay, It is taught in your book in 1.4 and 1.5, but we have not done that. Okay? So we'll get to this one later. Um, but there are other um, kinds of methods that you can use and other kinds of equations, period. So we already know what a polynomial equation looks like. You have coefficients, right? And then you have x's. And when you have it in this, what's called general form, basically your exponents decrease. So notice that whatever the highest exponent is, it goes first. Then the one that's less goes next, all the way down till your exponent is two, one, and then none, right? No x's at all. So if I were to have, a polynomial that say had the highest exponent of, of five. If I write it in its general form, it would be three X to the five minus two X to the fourth plus seven X squared. I'm missing a term, but that's okay. Oops, that would not be general form. I would have to have minus seven equal to zero in order to be general form. As long as your exponents are decreasing, that is what is considered general form, okay? Doesn't matter if anybody's missing, okay? You notice that I have a cube in there missing, right? That's okay, that's just not one of my terms. But it does have to be in what they call descending order. So the highest exponent first, and then all the exponents go after that. So for our first one, they're gonna kind of cover the factoring method, which we already know, but they're gonna cover it anyway, just to kind of um, jog back your memory. So if you do have something that looks kind of like a polynomial, the first thing you need to do is put it in its general form. So you have to move all the terms over so that it's equal to zero on one side, right? You have to have it equal to zero on one side. Not only that, is you have to make sure that it's in that descending order. So if I have this, and I wanna subtract 48x squared on both sides so that I can get the zero, you just have to remember that when you write these down on this side, you have to put them in the right order, okay? And since the x4 is a higher exponent than the x squared, that's why they have the x to the fourth term first and then the x squared term. Okay. It just needs to be in that order. Once it's in that order, then you can examine it on how to factor it. So the first thing you always do when you're factoring is that GCF, right? You have to take out the common factor if it has one, okay? And this one does have one because you can divide three and 48 by the number three. And if you look at the X's, you can take out, they both have X's, so you can take out X's, but you always go with the smaller exponent. So between four and two, the most you could take out from both would be the two, okay? 
because you can't take four from this guy, right? He doesn't even have four to give. So we would take out this x squared. And then how do you get what goes inside? You're basically dividing each of these things by three x squared. So three divided by three is the one, x to the fourth divided by x squared, you subtract exponents, so you get two. 48 divided by three is 16, and then the x squared cancel. So that's why there's no variables there, right? Then we know this, that this is the difference of two perfect squares. So they use the difference of squares formula, and they said that x times x will give me x squared, and four times four will give me 16. And then I just needed to remember that one gets the plus and one gets the minus, right? So they factored it. After they factor it, then they set each factor equal to zero. So you've got to set this guy equal to zero, this guy equal to zero, and then that guy equal to zero, okay? So three x squared equal to zero. There's some steps that happen, but the first step would be to divide by three. And then you end up with x squared equal to zero. Then the next step would be to take the square root, right? And normally you'd get plus or minus, but what's the square root of zero? Zero, and so is there really a such thing as a plus or minus zero? No, right? Zero is neutral, doesn't even have a sign, which is why they're saying that the solution here is just x equals to zero. That's for the first factor. For the second factor, which is on the back, so I can't even put it on the side. For the second factor, you would just have the minus four on both sides, and then you would get this as your answer, x equal to negative four. For the last factor, you would have to add four on both sides, which gives you x equal to positive four, okay? And so then those are all four of your solutions. You have zero, negative four, and positive four. Now, as long as you did everything correct, you would assume that your answers are correct. But if you're ever unsure if you did it correct, right? You can always check your answers. And how do you do that? You have to plug them into the original equation. Never go and plug them in to one of your steps because you don't know if any of your steps are wrong, right? So always make sure you go plug it in the, or in the original. So first they're checking zero. So they plug in zero where there was an X in the original equation. This was the original equation. So they plugged in zero for x here, zero for x there. And what do you end up with? You end up with zero on the left-hand side and zero on the right-hand side. And that's why they're saying that it checks out, okay? For this other one, they don't even tell you what that is, but let's do it in the calculator. Three parentheses, negative four raised to the fourth power. I get 768. And then let's do this side, 48 parentheses, negative four squared. I also get 768. So that's why that one checks out, okay? And then you can do the same. I'm just gonna go delete this four, the negative, and I get 768 again. And then if I go here and I delete that negative, I get 768. So as long as the left side equals the right side, that number that you plugged in checks out, okay? So that's nice because if you're on the test and you're doing your work, I need to clarify there. Checking is fantastic. It is an awesome thing to do, but that should not ever be the only thing you're doing, right? And I'm giving you a multiple choice test. You don't take all the answers in there and check them all and say, oh, this one's my answer and then leave it at that. I don't care if you go in through the multiple choices and you check all the answers and you know what the answer is. That is perfectly okay to do. But now, once you know what the answer is, I need you to show me the steps on how you get from the equation down to that answer. See what I'm saying? So I need to know, how do you go from here to telling me that the answers are zero, four, negative four, okay? You have to show that process, okay? The whole thing, okay? I am happy that you know how to check answers and you know how to figure out what the right answer is. That's fantastic, that's good stuff. But I also need you to know how to solve, right? So I need you to go in there and go through those steps. Knowing what the correct answer is, is, is only gonna get you that one point, right? One point out of 10 or 12.5 or whatever it is for the test. 
that's not going to make it. That means you'll get a 10. You usually get all the problems correct, and you'll still make a 10 on the test if that's all you do is select the right answers, right? So it's not good news. <laughs> so make sure that you're showing me your steps. And then be very careful with your um, notation. Because I noticed that there were like one, two, three, four, about four people that didn't make hundreds only because of their notation, not because they didn't understand the material. You guys know the material, so I got eight, right? But you're like not writing your steps all correctly, okay? Or you're just doing one little thing wrong. And so normally if I point it out, then it never happens again. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's out of habit and it just keeps happening. But that's why we're here, is to get better at this stuff, right? You want to get better. So make sure you show all of those steps whenever it says to solve something, okay? Now, there are, what is this one saying? A common mistake that is made in solving an equation, like example one, is to divide each side of the equation by the factor x squared. Ah, uh, yes. So that problem originally was this, right? Some people want to go ahead and say, oh, well, I can divide this by x squared and I can divide this by x squared. And then I get this problem and I can just solve that. But the problem is, is when you do this, even if you were to divide both sides by three, if I were to take the square root of both sides now, I'm only gonna get the plus or minus four. Notice I'm never going to get the solution zero ever if I did it this way, okay? And so that's why they're telling you that you never want to divide by variables. You wanna just solve it with all the variables there. Now, if I divide by three, that doesn't change my answer. And I'm gonna show and prove it to you. So the key thing here is to not divide by the variables. I could divide both sides by three and I will end up with this, okay? And if I move that over, I get that. If I factor out the GCF, I get this. If I factor that difference of squares, I get this. If I set each factor equal to zero, I still get zero, I still get negative four, and I still get positive four. So, nice. so dividing by a common factor when it's a number is totally okay to do but don't divide by common factors when they have variables in them, okay? So don't put X's down here to reduce, okay? Don't do that because you'll lose a solution, okay? But if it's just a number like three, then that's totally okay. You'll still get the same solution, okay? Just rule it. I just keep it the way it is and factor out the GCF, okay? That's just me. I don't have to think about when can I do it and when can I not. Just leave it alone and go, okay? Okay, so that is that page. Now here's where we start to get into this new concept. So another um, way to solve polynomials is this quadratic um, equation or quadratic type. So notice that instead of putting X's, they put u's in there, right? And that's because that u can be anything, any kind of algebraic expression. It could just be an x like this, or it could be a whole algebraic expression like that. Notice that I have the algebraic expression here, and then I have the same algebraic expression here, but with the square, okay? That's when it's called the quadratic type, okay? So you might see stuff like that. Here, you, here's another one in disguise. This one's in disguise. That's in disguise because it doesn't look like a whole quadratic expression squared and then a whole quadratic expression by itself, right? But if I write it like this, then you can see it. Is that top line equivalent to this line? 
If I take x squared and I square that, do I end up with x to the fourth? I do, right? So these are equivalent to one another. But when it's written like this, you can see that you have an expression here and then you have that same expression squared, right? And so this thing is a quadratic type as well because it can be manipulated to look like the quadratic type, okay? That's gonna come in handy later because we will be solving some problems with quadratic types, okay? Good morning. Um, you wanna come pick this up when, before you leave at least. Um, radical equations are different ones. Radicals are these little things, right? The square root, the cube root, the fourth root, who knows what kind of root? Any kind of root, right? That's what a radical is. And so now we're gonna solve equations that have radicals. It could have one radical or it could have more than one radical, okay? It just depends on the problem. But we need to know how to solve them. So the steps, they didn't even give me the steps. How about that? The steps to solving this thing is to isolate one of the radical expressions. Then two, um, apply an exponent, which will eliminate the radical. So you already know that a square will undo a square root. A cube should undo a cube root. A fourth power should undo a fourth root, right? That's what it means by apply the exponent that will um, eliminate that radical. It all depends on what kind of radical you had that will tell you what kind of exponent to apply. And then solve resulting equation. Sometimes though, if this resulting equation still has a radical in it, you're gonna have to go back and repeat steps one through three again, okay? And we'll see that with example two down at the bottom, in just a bit. So this step, you may have to like come back over here and repeat, okay? It just depends on what that resulting equation looks like. Sometimes the resulting equation is just a linear equation, which is super easy to solve. Sometimes the resulting equation is a quadratic, which we know how to solve by factoring. And sometimes it's still a radical equation. And so you have to do the whole three steps again, okay? So for example 2a, they have this equation. This was my original. And so in order for me to isolate the radical, I need to get rid of that one term that doesn't have a radical next to it. Do you see the minus x? It doesn't have a radical. Only the 2x plus 7 has that square root over it, right? So I need to get rid of that x by adding x to both sides. When you do that, it goes away on the left-hand side, which is why all you have on the left-hand side is the radical. And then on the right side, remember, you always want to try to put them in order, right? And x's always go before your uh, constants, okay? So x is first and then your constant. So notice they put the positive x in the front and the positive two in the back and put a plus sign in the middle because this guy is positive. You're adding these two guys together. So you have to put some sort of um, operator in the middle. It's either gonna be plus or it's gonna be minus and it depends on the sign. Since that two was positive, that's why it's a plus. Okay. From there, you're going to apply the exponent that will eliminate the radical. What kind of radical is this? What kind of root? What is the index right there? It's a two. When there's nothing there, it's automatically a two, right? And so then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply whatever that index is, that's the exponent that I'm gonna apply on both sides. So when you apply that exponent on the left, it undoes the radical. 
And so that's why you only have the 2x plus 7 now. But on the right-hand side, you actually have to square it, okay? And if you remember, x plus 2 squared means x plus 2 times itself, doesn't it? And so then if you FOIL this out, you get x squared plus 2x, and then for that one, 2x plus 4. And if you combine these like terms, that's where this expression came from, okay? They don't show you all those steps. I write all those steps when I'm doing the problems, but I notice that the books like to skip a lot of steps. And so I just wanna make sure that I fill it in, <laughs> what's going on, okay? So they are actually foiling that out and then combining those like terms. Once you have that, what kind of equation? Once you square everybody, step back and look and see what kind of equation you have. I do not have a linear equation because of that x squared term. And as long as x squared is the highest exponent, then what I have there is a quadratic. And we know that when it's a quadratic, you have to get it equal to zero and then factor it, okay? So the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna subtract two x and subtract seven from both sides. And I put it underneath the terms that were like them, okay? So on the left side, you get that zero, x squared stays x squared, but 4x minus 2x is where this positive 2x came from. And then positive 4 minus 7 is where the minus 3 came from. Okay, so they're just combining those like terms to get these two like terms, or those two results. Then from there, it's a matter of factoring. Now, if you're using the AC method, you can skip all of the grouping steps because there's no number in front, right? So you would figure out what times what is gonna give me negative three, but when I add them, I get positive two. The only factors of three are one times three. So what do the signs need to be so that when I multiply them, I get negative three, but when I combine them, I get a positive two. Who would have to be negative? Mm -hmm. So that negative one times three is negative three and negative one plus three is two. And if you're ever unsure, I mean, you have your handy dandy calculator, right? You can always do it, negative one plus three, one plus negative three and see which one's gonna give you this positive two, okay? If you're ever unsure about your signs, that's why you have this calculator. Once I know those, only because there's no number in front of that x squared. If there is a number in front of that x squared, it's a whole process, right? I have to split the middle term and then group both sides and then factor it, right? When there's no number in front, you can cheat. <laughs> you say x times x is x squared, and then whatever those numbers were that you found, they go inside the parentheses. Notice that they have a positive three like I do and a negative one like I do, right? You can only shortcut like this when there's no number in front of the x squared, okay? Once you have it factored, which is not an easy process, factoring is hard, but once you have it factored, it's just a matter of setting each factor equal to zero to find your solutions. This one's way down here. We put it way at the bottom, okay? So if you set the x plus three equal to zero, all you do is subtract three on both sides and you end up with this solution. And then if you set the other factor equal to zero, you would have to add one to both sides, which would give you the um, solution of x equal to positive one, okay? That's great. It's long, these problems are long. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they're long. <laughs> um, the next one's even longer like way longer. Okay, whenever there's two radicals, expect the problem to be super long. So in part B of this example, notice that this equation, this is the original, this one has two radicals this time. And so in the directions, the first step said to isolate one of them, okay? Now I'll be honest with you, it's gonna be easier to isolate this guy because he doesn't have any coefficient in the front. This one has a negative in the front, okay? It's like it has a coefficient of negative one in the front. So if you ever have a choice, 
If there's a radical that has no coefficient in front of it, that's the one you want to isolate, okay? So I want to actually get rid of this radical. And the only way to do that is to add the entire radical to the other side, okay? And when you do that on the left, it goes away. So all I have is that one radical that I was trying to get by itself. And on the right side, again, you always want your variables in the front and your constants in the back, right? So as ugly as these variables look inside a house, the variables went first and then the positive one constant went in the back, okay? There is nothing wrong with leaving it like this. It's just that's not the way the books will typically do it because that's not the formal way to write it, okay? You always like the constants in the back. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. If you leave it like that, you will get the same answer, I promise. Um, once you have this thing isolated, you're gonna do that same step. What kind of index does this radical have? If there's no number right there, what is it automatically? A two. So then in order for me to get rid of this radical, I'm gonna to have to square this side and square the whole other side, the whole thing. You cannot square each term, okay? When you're applying a square, you have to square the whole left side and you have to square the whole right side. That is going to be a big thing because I will have students that will have that. They'll have this and then they'll square, square, and square, and say the answer is 2x minus 5, x minus 3, and then 1, because 1 squared is 1. And that is completely wrong. You can't do that, okay? You can't. You have to square the entire side and this entire side. And I already mentioned to you guys, when you have two terms like this, it does not equal both individual guys squared, right? We talked about that before. It does not mean that. What it means is to take this thing and multiply it by itself. And so that's exactly what I've got to do here to get this next line, okay? Now it's more complicated than this is making it look like it is, but there are some steps there, okay? So let's go through those steps real quick on the side. So I need to do this. I need to do square root of x minus three plus one times another square root of x minus three plus one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this radical and I'm gonna distribute it to these two terms, okay? When I multiply the square root times the square root, I'm gonna end up with that square root squared because it's the same radical times itself, right? Then when I multiply that radical times the one, I'm gonna end up with one radical x minus three. That's great. That's the first term has been distributed. Now I've got to take the second term and distribute it. So when I do that, positive one times that is one square root of x minus three and positive one times the other positive one is still just positive one. What happens to the first term? Mm -hmm. The square and the radical just cancel and you get that. Now here, these are like terms. Remember, in order for you to be like terms, you have to both have a radical and what's inside the radical has to match. And they do, right? So I've got one of these radicals over here plus another radical over there. So how many of those radicals do I have? Mm -hmm. I have two of these radicals. And then the plus one is still just there as plus one. And so that's where they got all of that information from. They just skipped the whole process, okay? But if you notice, we have the same four terms. We have X, we have minus three, we have positive two square root of X minus three, and we have one. Those are the four terms and they're exactly the same. Now, once you squared everything, that's when I told you, you got to take a step back <laughs> and look at what kind of equation you have now. So if I just look at this step back, look at it, overview, what kind of equation is it? 
it's not a linear because of that little square root, that house. It's still a radical equation, isn't it? Okay. When it's still a radical equation, your goal is going to be to isolate that radical again. Okay. So your goal now is going to be to get that x minus three all by itself. Okay. So, and actually they don't even make you get the, the radical by itself. They let you have the coefficient with it. So all they did here was combine these guys. Negative three plus one, isn't that negative two? Mm -hmm. This term just came down, the X just came down and these guys just came down. Then from there, what they did was they minus X on both sides and they added two on both sides so that you could get that radical by itself. So now I have positive two radical X minus three, 2x minus x is x, negative 5 plus 2 is this negative 3. Okay. So then now I've got to get rid of this radical. Once I ra isolate this, what kind of index is there? Remember, this is a coefficient. This guy is a coefficient. It's just a big 2 in the front. But what is the little tiny index right there? Mm -hmm. It's also a two. So then that means I still need to take this whole side and square it and take this whole side and square it. Now, on the left-hand side, we know we can write this, right? And on the right-hand side, you can even write that one. On the left-hand side, I'm going to get x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. This is not two terms times two terms. It's just one term times one term. So everything's going to get multiplied together. What is 2 times 2? Two? 2 times 2? Two? 4. And then when I get the square root of x minus 3 times the square root of x minus 3, what do you end up with? It's written like this, square root of x minus 3, but squared, right? When you have a thing times itself, it's always written as a square. And then what happens to the square and the little house? What happens right here? It cancels out. So all you have is this four times that X minus three. And you have to put the X minus three in parentheses because the four has to get multiplied by all of that, right? So it has to just automatically have parentheses now. So I wanted to show you those steps because all they do is have that bottom step on the next page. And you're not gonna know where that came from unless you saw it being worked out, okay? But they actually square the left side. So you foil it all out and you get this side. And then on the other side, you end up with this four times X minus three. I'm gonna show you a faster way to get there than these steps right here, okay? So instead of these steps, you can get to this a lot faster from here. What do I get when I do two squared? I get four, right? And what do you get when you have a house squared, a square root squared? It just cancels out and you have the X minus three, right? Okay, so you don't have to do all of these steps. You can just know square and square and you'll get the two factors, okay? It's a little bit easier to do it that way. Once I have this, step back from it, right? Because I've officially squared everything. Step back from it, what kind of equation do you have here? Right here. You have a quadratic because of that x squared. So as soon as you realize you have a quadratic, you have to get the whole thing equal to zero, factor it, set each factor equal to zero. So before I do that, I definitely wanted to distribute this. So this is going to become 4x minus 12. And then if I minus 4x on both sides, 
negative 6x minus 4x is where the negative 10x came from. And if I add 12 to both sides, 9 plus 12 is where the 21 came from. And then, of course, since both of these cancel, that's why you have 0 on the right-hand side. These little arrows are getting on my nerves. Okay, so first distribute and then move over your 4x and then move over your 12 and you will eventually get it equal to zero. Once you have it equal to zero, you do the factoring bit. So I've got to figure out how I'm going to get 21 and how I'm going to get negative 10. So you do 21. I think that's the only factors we have. So it, pretty sure it's going to be three and seven, right? That would give me 10. But what would the signs have to be so that I end up with a positive when I multiply, but a negative 10 when I combine? Double negative. So negative three and negative seven. And yes, that does check out. And so that's exactly why they have negative three and negative seven in there. Okay. You don't have to do the grouping because there's no number in front of the x squared. Set this factor equal to zero and then set the other factor equal to zero to find your two solutions. Okay. We will have practice problems on this one. And I might have you go practice it right now before I get into absolute values, just because that makes sense to me. <laughs> so go ahead and flip over and go to practice one. I'm gonna go out of order from your packet. I don't wanna go into absolute values just yet. So go to number one and try it. I'm gonna pause the recording for just a bit because I wanna give you some time to do it. And then I'm also gonna write the solution on the board. But let me pause the video so they're not waiting on us to figure this one out. Okay, so for this one, did anybody do this first step? Which was to minus the 4x over and add the 5 over. Anybody did that? Everybody did that? Okay, once you did that, you would have gotten the negative 8 square root of x by itself, right? And then you would have had the negative 4x and the positive 5 on the other side, right? Now you can square it from there because the term with the square root is by itself. When you do that, you could use that shortcut we talked about, right? Where you square the number in the front and then you just square the radical. But over here, you have a, a, a binomial that's being squared. So you actually have to write it out twice so that you can foil it. Negative eight squared is a positive 64. And the radical and the square should cancel, right? So you just have 64x on the left hand side all by yourself, or by himself or herself, whatever. Then on this side, I actually foiled it all out, right? So negative 4x times negative 4x is this guy, negative 4x times 5 is that guy, 5 times negative 4x is this term, and then 5 times 5 is this term, right? I went ahead and just combined the two like terms over here on the right. So I got negative 40 X inside there. Then I looked at it and I noticed this is a quadratic equation now, right? There's an X squared in there somewhere. And that's the highest exponent, which means I need to get the whole thing equal to zero. So what I did was I moved the 64 over and I just put it where it belongs. Instead of writing it underneath, I put it right there in the middle where it belongs. So I put it in between the 40x and the 25. See it right there? And then I went ahead and combined those guys. So I got negative 104x now. Now this was the hard part was the factoring part, okay? So I do have a number in front, which means I do have to do the whole process of the AC method, right? I can't just cheat once I find the magic numbers and just say, this is the answer. I have to actually finish it out. So what I did was, is I wrote it up here just so I could do all my AC method. And I'm basically doing 16 times positive 25, which is where that positive 400 came from. 
So I got to figure out what will multiply to give me that 400, but still add to give me that negative 104 in the middle. And so I was thinking, oh, it's going to be 100 times 4. That's 400. And 100 plus 4 is 104, right? So that's where my brain went automatically. But when I tried it with positives, it's not working, right? I'm not going to get negative 104. So then I tried it with both negatives, and then that one did work, okay? So negative 100 and negative 4 are the magic numbers. But I cannot jump and say that this is going to be the answer, even though those are the magic numbers. Because when I FOIL this out, I'm never going to get 16x squared. I'm just going to get x squared, right? So you can't do that shortcut when there's a number in the front. So I went ahead and I did the whole process. I took the negative 104 and split it up according to the magic numbers. So instead of negative 104x, we wrote negative 100x minus 4x. If I were to combine those, it's equivalent to what I was given, right? But the, the trick is, is to split it up nicely enough so everything else falls into place, right? So these magic numbers are going to help all the rest of it um, flow. So I cut off this half and I looked at these two. This is the grouping, right? What do these guys have in common? Both of them could be divided by four and both of them have an X. So I took that out. Then 16 divided by four is four. X squared divided by X is X. Negative 100 divided by four is negative 25. And the X divided by the X means there's no more X's here. Okay. Then I went on to the last two terms, and I noticed that I do have to take out the negative, but these guys don't have anything in common. So I just left the negative there, and I opened the parentheses. And a negative divided by a negative turned this guy positive. A positive divided by a negative turned this guy negative. Right? If you distribute this and you distribute this minus, you should get all four terms. That's how you know you factored it out correctly. Okay. Once I have the same factor, I can factor this factor out, but then I have to write in the other parentheses what's left over. So I wrote down the 4x, but all I had there was a minus. It has to be minus something, right? And so I had to remember that there is an invisible one in there. There's always an invisible one coefficient. And so that's where this one came from. Because remember, you have to have two terms. This is one term and this is two terms. So when you factor out that 4x minus 25, you must have two terms in there, okay? You can't just have 4x minus. <laughs> it has to be 4x minus something, right? So it's a one that was in the front. So now that's all my side work just to factor, right? Once I got these factors, I just put it in here. So what was I doing from here to here? From here to here, I was factoring, right? But now that I have it factored, I'm going to set this factor equal to zero, and I'm going to set that factor equal to zero. Here, I added 25 over and then divided by four. Here, I added the one over and then divided by four. And so I got these two answers. Now, I don't think that it mentioned it, and maybe it did, but I don't think it did. If I go look at the notes. It did not ever talk about checking answers on example A. And it did not talk about checking answers on example two. However, I will tell you, oh yeah, it did. It just said real quick, the solutions are x equal to three and x equal to seven. And it says check these, are these in the original equation, okay? So I'm assuming that they actually already did it and that's why they know that those are the solutions. But for us, we have not checked them. And so we have to check them. When it comes to solving linear equations, it is not necessary to check. If you did everything right, you will get the right solutions. For quadratics, it is not necessary to check. If you did everything right, you will get the right solutions. However, with radicals and fractions, you could do everything right and still get wrong answers, okay? Um, those, those, those types of answers are called, it's a weird name, it's called extraneous, extraneous solutions. And I might be spelling that word completely wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it just means an extra solution, 
okay? There's an extra solution in there and it doesn't actually check out, okay? Um, and this is an example of when that happens because I know that I did everything correctly. And when I go to check this answer, I plugged it into the original. I just replaced the X, right? There was four times an X minus eight times the square root of X. So I just put the 25 over four everywhere there was an X. I realized that the fours would cancel, leaving me with 25. The square root of 25 over four is just five over two. And so then this, um, this will actually just turn out to equal 20, right? Eight divided by two is four, and that four times the five is where I got 20. You can type the whole thing in your calculator as well to get the 20, but I got the 20. And then 25 minus 20 minus five does give me zero, and that is what's on the other side. So this answer does check out, but watch what happens when I go to check one four, okay? When I plug in one four, the fours do cancel when I get one, and the square root of one fourth is one half. You could type it in your calculator if you don't know that. Um, and when I multiply eight times one half, I do get a four. But I end up with one minus four minus five. That actually turns out to equal negative eight, okay? But on the right-hand side, I have zero, don't I? Not negative eight. So this one is a bad solution, okay? I did everything correctly. It's just not a solution. It's one of these extraneous solutions, okay? So it's just an extra solution that happens and it's not our answer. So when you go into the web assign, do not ever type in any extraneous solution. It will tell you the answer's wrong. You did everything right. You got these two answers, but if you try to enter both of them in the web assign, it will tell you, no, you're wrong. Okay, because one of them is a bad guy and you have to take away that one. So in web assign, the only answer I would type in is the 25 over four, okay? I, I'm glad that this popped up in an equation because it would be awful for me not to explain this. And then you go try to do your homework and you keep getting wrong answers, right? Um, you definitely need to be cautious of the extraneous solution. Anytime you have equations that have radicals or fractions, you must, check your answers. You have to, because you could get bad ones, okay? Even if you did everything right. Okay, the next one, we'll try to do it together. The next one, what do you think I should do first for number two? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we can get that radical jump by itself, right? Now, this is going to still stay in negative 40 whole works. That five is now gone. And how would I write the right hand side? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter that there's a negative coefficient, right? That guy is not the problem. The radical is by itself, the radical term is by itself. It's all that's important. So I can go in and do the power to get rid of the radical. But which power should I be using here? The two again, and why? Because this little guy is a two, right? So I can take this whole side and square it and take this whole side and square it. When I do that here, what is the coefficient here? It just looks like a minus. What is it really? Uh -huh. It's like a little invisible negative one coefficient, right? So what you've got to do is you've got to do that negative one squared, and then you have to do the house squared. Always take your coefficient squared and the house squared. Notice how I did that up here. I took whatever that coefficient was and squared it, and then the house and squared it, right? I'm using one of those exponent properties. You have an exponent property that says, if you have this, you can do this. What I was saying you can't do is when there's a plus or minus in there, that's when you can't do this, okay? So if these guys are multiplied together, you can square each person individually. But when you have a plus or minus in between, you can't square them individually, okay? It's a big difference. So here, these are multiplied together, right? The negative one is multiplied by that square root. That's what allows me to separate it and do this guy squared and then do that guy squared. 
This side though has a minus sign in the middle. So I can't square the X and square the five, okay? I have to FOIL it out. Now on the left side, negative one times negative one is what? Positive one. And then this is gonna undo the house. So I'm gonna end up with 40 minus 12 X. Over here, let's see, X squared minus five X minus five X plus 25. And if you distribute that one, nothing's gonna change. It's still 40 minus 12 X. And if I combine these, I get this as my next line. Once you square everything and you've simplified each individual side, take a step back and look at it. What kind of equation is this? Yep, quadratic because of that x squared guy. So I have to get the whole thing equal to zero and then I can factor. And this one doesn't have a number in front, so the factoring part's a little short, right? So let's see, minus 40 goes with that guy, and then plus 12x goes under this guy. So I put the constants with the constants, and then the x's with the x's. So how many x's do I end up with? Mm -hmm, positive 2x. And then what about my constant? Negative 50. Okay. And then let's see what is going to be the numbers that multiply to give me negative 15, but then add to give me positive 2. Can you think of those guys? Mm -hmm. Three and five, yep. Yes, the five would have to be positive and three would have to be negative in order for me to get a positive two, right? When I combine them, you are right. Now, what do I do after I factor it? Mm -hmm. Solve what? Mm -hmm. Individually, right? You got it. So x minus 3 equal to 0 and x plus 5 equal to 0. So if I add 3 and if I minus 5, I get these two solutions. But we already know just from experience on a practice one that one of those might be an extra guy, right? Might be. It can happen where both of those are extra guys and there's actually no solution. It could be that just one of them is the extra guy and you only have one solution. Or it could be that both actually work and you have two solutions. We have no idea which of those three situations we have unless we check it, okay? So we have to check them. So I'm gonna come over here because this is the only place I have any more space for this problem. And I'm gonna check each one. So first I'm gonna check x equal to three. Remember, you've got to plug it into the original equation. Oops, plus five equal to x, which is three in this one. So I get negative square root of 40 minus 36, right? 12 times three is 36. Okay, good. <laughs> And then when I subtract that, I get four. And then when I take the square root of four, I get two. Now I didn't put that square root in, so I don't put plus or minus, okay? You only put plus or minus if you introduced the square root to the problem. This square root was already there, so I don't need to be doing any extra plus or minus stuff. Now what, that's actually positive three now, isn't it? So this guy's good. This guy is an answer, okay? But now we have to go check the other guy. So I'm gonna say negative square root of 40 minus 12 times negative five plus five equal to the X, which the one I'm checking is negative five. So notice I put the negative five here and I put the negative five there. 
in both places there was an X. So in there and out here. Oh gosh, what is negative 12 times negative five? The positive, what? Is it 60? I think it's 60, right? Yeah, okay, good. So then 40 plus 60 is actually 100. And then the square root of 100 is 10. And negative 10 plus five is negative five. So we get the same thing on both sides on this one as well. So both of these are answers this time. Okay. So both of them, the last one, only one of them worked, but this time they both do. It can happen that neither one will work. If that happens where you check it and both of them are bad, um, then the answer you're going to put in the computer is no solution, okay? And on the test, it'll have an option that says no solution, okay? Okay, one more radical problem to practice, and then we'll start talking about those, um, some new guys, okay? Because they didn't explain anything about rational exponents, but we know that rational exponents are nothing more than um, the radicals. <laughs> they are the radicals, so we know that. So I'm gonna talk about that. Did everybody get this one or did I move it too fast? Everybody got it? Okay, so this one's the one with the doubles. Now, oh gosh, they both have coefficients in it, okay? Which one do you wanna move over? It really doesn't matter, it's a choice. You will get the same answer as long as you do everything correct. Do you wanna move over the three square root of X plus one? Or do you wanna move over the square root of seven X plus eight? What would you do if you were looking at this and you knew you needed to get one of them by themselves? Which one? The negative one? Me personally, that's what I do. I move the negative guys over because then they become positive, right? And I like positives <laughs> more than I like the negatives. Okay, so yeah, I would do that. So we're gonna add this whole radical to the other side. And I'm gonna show you that you will still work out just fine if you don't write that right-hand side in the formal manner. You can write it like this. What I don't want you to think that you can do is combine this one and this invisible one and tell me that it, there's two of them because there are not two radicals, are there? Okay, so just don't do that and you're safe to write it like this. Now that you have one of them by themselves, you can get rid of the radicals. How do I get rid of radicals? Square them. So I'm gonna square this whole side and I'm gonna square this whole side. Now on this side, because they're multiplied together, right? The three is multiplied by this radical. I can square individually. But this one has a plus in the middle, which means I cannot square them individually. So on this side, I am forced to just write it out twice and then foil it. What do we get on the left side after you square? Mm -hmm. Like this? No, why, what's wrong with it? 
Yes, I'm missing parentheses. Who should be in parentheses? Mm -hmm. Good. Because that nine has to get multiplied by that whole second thing, right? Okay, here, one times one, it's just one. One times this radical is just the radical. You could put the one there in the front if you want to. It doesn't, make, it doesn't, you can or you cannot, it's a choice. Both are correct. Positive square root times the one is gonna give me the same positive square root. And then the last one is the square root times the square root. What happens when you multiply the square root times the square root? They will because you'll get the square root squared, right? So eventually it just cancels. So you can just cancel it. You don't have to write that. You don't have to write the square root with a little two and then in the next step, wait till they go away. Okay. But I do have like terms on the right hand side and I can still manipulate a little bit the left hand side. What can I do on the left hand side? Distribute. So then this becomes 9x plus 9. And over here, I don't have anything to go with the 7x. So I'm going to write the 7x first. But then I have positive 1 and positive 8 as constants. So I actually have positive 9 as a constant. right? And I've got two radicals here. One radical plus another radical. So now I have a positive two of these radicals. So I have squared everything and I have even simplified both sides. Now is where you take the step back and you look at it and you ask yourself, what kind of equation do I have here? Is it still a radical equation? It is, which means I have to isolate that term now. Okay, so this is the guy you want to get by himself, that whole term. So who has to move then? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to minus 7x and minus 9 to move them. That makes the 9 go away. I only have 2x on the left side. And this is my positive 2 root of seven x plus eight. Now the term with the radicals by itself, the whole term. So how do you get rid of the radical from here? Mm -hmm. Squared. You got it. So we'll square this whole side, and we'll square this whole side. And remember, as long as they're multiplied. You can square them individually. As long as there's not a plus or a minus in between the two factors, you can square it. So here I end up with 4x squared, 4 times 7x plus 8. So what kind of equation do you have now? Mm -hmm. And if you're unsure, you can um, distribute that for, I think that's right. I don't know why I'm second guessing my time tables today, but I am. So then now I'm going to go ahead and move everybody over. now. You only have one term to move over, so it might make sense to move that guy over there. But if I did that, wouldn't he become negative? And I don't like it when the x squared term is negative because then I have to factor out the negative. I just don't want to go there. So I would rather move these two guys to the other side. So I'd rather do the problem so that it looks like this, right? So I minus the 28x over and I minus the 32 over. Is there a GCF? Is there something I could factor from all three? Mm -hmm. So then I get x squared minus 7 minus 
eight. And then now there's no longer an X, there's no longer a coefficient in here. So I can do the shortcut. And what factors are gonna multiply to give you negative eight, but add to give you negative seven? Take the factors of eight, you have one and eight and two and four, and that's it. Those are your only choices. Which one of those are gonna give you seven? I have no idea why this thing keeps wanting to put the grid on my page. There we go. So, but it's probably gonna be one and eight, right? That gives me seven. But what do the signs have to be so that I end up with a negative seven? Say it again. Mm -hmm, negative eight and then a positive one, right? Those will multiply to give me the negative eight I need but they'll combine to give me the negative seven I need. And since I'm only factoring what's inside the parentheses, there is no number in front of that X squared inside the parentheses. So I did not need to do the whole process, the grouping part. Now, if I set this factor equal to zero, do you get any solutions from that? Do you get anything that says like X equals something or another? Is four even equal to zero? <laughs> no. So you don't get any solutions from this particular factor because there's no variables in it, okay? But here you do get a solution. What do you get? X equal to, mm -hmm, and over here, negative one. But we don't know for sure if both of those are actual answers, okay? So let's go check them. We'll check eight first. So everywhere I see an X, I'm gonna plug in an eight. You can do this in your calculator too, you know that, right? I'm gonna write it on paper just so people know what I'm putting in my calculator. But I can type that whole left-hand side in my calculator. I just type three square root eight plus one, and then get out of the square root, minus sign, square root again, seven parentheses, eight plus eight. And if I hit enter, it tells me that all of this is one. Does that match what's on the right-hand side? It does. So then eight checks out. Now let's check this one. So we get three, X is now a negative one. And let's go plug all of that left-hand side in the calculator. So three square root of negative one plus one out minus square root of seven times negative one plus eight. I get in the calculator, I get negative one. Is that equal to one? They're different, right? So then this one does not check out. So my only answer in web assign would be x equal to eight, and that's it. We may not get to, that's not strong, but we may not get to the absolute values today. That's okay. We get to it when we get to it, right? Gotta wait till Monday, we'll wait till Monday, okay? There's no like lesson part to this problem, okay? It's just in the practice and they never discussed it in the actual lecture, okay? The reason that is, is because this guy is a radical. It's a radical equation. You have to remember that your rational exponents, the big rule, the big one, and you had a test over it. The big rule is, is that if you have this kind of exponent, 
the denominator becomes the index and the numerator becomes the exponent. Remember that rule? I probably scribbled it on your paper 10 times on that test, right? <laughs> That's the rule we need to apply. So these little exponents, fraction exponents, they are radicals. And so that's why they never gave us any extra directions on this problem because it's a radical equation and we already know how to solve those, okay? So let's change these to radicals and see what's going on. Now, I had some people asking me for help with this homework. And the biggest thing I remembered about the homework that had to do with this is that there is a difference between this and this, okay? Here, your base is the entire 3x. And so when you go to rewrite it, the whole 3x has to go inside, okay? But when you have it like this, this is not part of the base. It's just a coefficient, which means it stays a coefficient in the front. And it's only the x that has to go on the inside, okay? So huge difference between whether the three is included in the radical or the three is not included in the radical, okay? Here are any of these coefficients or are these coefficients or are they part of the basis? In this problem number four. Are they in parentheses? Nope. So that means that they're coefficients, okay? So that means that that three is gonna stay there and this plus five is gonna stay there and the eight's just an eight, but they have to stay there, okay? The only thing I'm converting is this. And what kind of radical is it gonna become according to that rule? Is it a square root? Uh-huh, it's on your paper. Should be able to see it better on your paper. <laughs> but yes, it is a three, right? The denominator tells us that index, right? So this is going to be a cube root and a cube root because they both have a three denominator. But in here, the X is only gonna have a one power and in here, the X is going to have a two power. Now, Part of this rule was another piece. Somebody said in that rule that you could also write it like this. But this was an alternative way to use the fraction exponent. So instead of putting the power on the inside with the A, you can also choose to put the power on the outside, okay? I followed the rule using it the first way, but now, me because I'm experienced, right? My brain is already seeing that this is a quadratic type, okay? Because you have a cube root and a cube root, but one of them is a regular X and one of them is a squared X. And that fits that, just that quadratic type description. But it's more obvious if I do a few things. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just write that as this. And this one, I'm gonna write it as that. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this term in the front. And then the positive three will go in the back. And then the last thing I'm going to do is minus that eight over. Now I'm gonna write that little formula that it had on that first page. It said, in order for you to be a quadratic type, you had to look like this. Now it says plus, but if these numbers are negative, it's gonna have a minus, right? But that does fit that description. Don't I have a coefficient and then something squared? And then another coefficient times that same something that's in the parentheses. And then a coefficient equal to zero, right? So this is that quadratic type. Now they didn't tell me how to solve quadratic types, but the way to do it is to use what's called substitution, okay? So this looks way too complicated for my eyes. So instead of trying to factor that, because that's how you factor quadratics, right? 
instead of trying to factor this, it's better if you come over here and you say, let, we can use use, because that's what the book chose to use. Let u equal whatever it is that was being squared. Okay, so in my case, the u is gonna be the cube root of x. So then when I rewrite this equation, this is gonna look like five u squared plus three u minus eight equal to zero. Now that is way easier for my eyes to process to be able to factor. Okay. I wouldn't know how to factor it if it had a cube root in there, right? Now I'm not gonna go through the whole process. If you need to practice your, um, what is it, AC method, go for it, please. Two and four, ten and four, no. Maybe 20, 20. Hmm. I don't know if this guy can be factored. Five times eight is what, 40? So I have negative 40. Two and 23, nope. Four and 10. Um, Five and eight, yeah. Okay, I see what it wants. So this one needs to be minus and this one needs to be plus. Okay, so five u times five, five u times u is five u squared. Five u times negative one is negative five u. Eight times u is positive eight u. And then eight times negative one is negative eight. So this does give me the three U and I do get the negative E. Okay, cool. So I factored it correctly. I was using the guess and check. Once I knew my factors, the ones I wanted to use, I was just guessing on how I would have to put them in there, okay? Um, notice I didn't use that five because I knew that the five would have to get multiplied by whatever's over here. So I just used a one and I got that five. If you don't know how to do that, go through the grouping. 5u squared minus 5u plus 8u minus 8. Factor out the 5u, you get u minus 1. Factor out the 8, you get u minus 1. And then you have the same answer as I do, right? So if you need to do your method over here, do it, okay? If you know how to look at things and know how to factor them, do that, but make sure you actually know how to factor. Don't just guess. If you're gonna guess, make sure that it's right by checking it. You just saw me do that. I just guessed and then I checked it, right? And it worked. We're like two thirds of the way there. <laughs> so we have to get these guys equal to zero. Right, we definitely have to set them equal to zero. That's how you solve quadratics. So if I minus eight over and then I divide by five, I'll get this solution. And then if I add one over, I'll get that solution. However, was the original problem, did the original problem have u's in it? It did not, right? <laughs> So I cannot say that negative eight over five and one are my answer because those are u's, those are not x's, okay? This is where you do what's called back substitution. So now you gotta go back. What the heck was u? Well, I said at the very beginning or halfway in that u was actually the cube root of x in that. So then that means that these two equations will become the cube root of x equal to negative eight fifths and the cube root of x equal to one. How do you solve an equation when you have a radical by itself? Once the radical is by itself, you're supposed to apply a power to cancel out the radical. What power would I have to apply to this to cancel out the radical? 
Right, it's not gonna be a square anymore, right? Because this is not a square root. It's a cube root. So you have to take this whole side and cube and this whole side and cube. And it's actually the same thing on the other side because it also has a cube root of X. So over here, the house goes away and I get X. And then over there, who knows what that is? Parentheses, fraction, negative eight over five. And then I'm gonna raise it to the third power so I can cube it. So I get this nasty number. It is what it is. I'll check it. What's one cube? We should know that one. One. So those are my two answers. I need to check them in the original equation. I am gonna solely rely on my calculator to do this checking, okay? I have to go to this original and I'm gonna plug in this really ugly number. So three parentheses, fraction, negative 512 over 125, close it. And I have to raise it to a fraction exponent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit, I already hit the exponent, but notice how I'm tiny, or you can't see my calculator. Let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see my paper and my calculator. Okay, so I'm taking this answer and I'm plugging it into here. So I already hit this button. I need to type in a fraction. So I'm gonna hit fraction again, and then type in that one third. And then get out. Now I'm on the side. I can hit the plus sign. Five parentheses fraction, nasty number. Close those parentheses, raise the exponent, hit the fraction again and type in two thirds. So my paper, it should match, right? I'm, what I'm doing is plugging this in parentheses for X. If I hit enter and it equals eight, then this is the solution. If I hit enter and it's not, exactly eight, then this is one of those extra solutions, okay? And it does turn out to equal eight. So this one is a solution. Now we're gonna do the same thing. You don't even have to do that, but it doesn't matter what exponent you raise one to, it's still one, isn't it? So I'm gonna type it in here, but then I'm gonna talk it out in a second. Because this one you really don't have to check. If you know enough about the number one, um, you would know that it's gonna turn out to equal eight. Okay, so this one works also. But if I have one raised to any power, one raised to any power, it's still gonna be one, isn't it? So three times that one makes this still a three. If I have one raised to the two thirds, it's still a one. And five times that one is still a five. And what is three plus five? It's equal to eight, right? So the one I didn't necessarily need to go check in the calculator, but I did it anyway, just to be sure. If ever in doubt, <laughs> use your calculator. Okay, let me see, where are we in time? Yeah, we have like five minutes. Okay, let me go look at the homework real quick, just to see. I know you're not gonna be able to see it just yet because I haven't put it in there. Um, but I'm telling you as soon as, by the time the online students see this video, because it takes a while for it to process, right? And then for me to upload it. By the time they see the video, it'll already all be up there. But for you guys, it's not up there yet. Just as a rule of thumb, it is always better to do the homework as soon as you receive the information, then to let time elapse and then try to go back and do it. That's just the, the best practice. Um, so if you can today get in there and start 1.6, I would suggest that you do that. Um, just so that while the concepts are fresh in your mind, you're able to crank out all of those solutions. But understand, from 14 on, you will not be able to do, okay? 14 on, you may be able to figure them out on your own, but we have not talked about how to do 14 on, okay? So if you wanna go in there and just get done what you can get done with what you've learned today, just go up to number 13 and then stop, okay?
Okay. And then wait until we see each other again on Monday and we'll talk about both of those um, absolute values. Okay. But you guys have a good weekend and I will see you on Monday, I hope.